all of these protections were not making people less vulnerable and nobody is you know, going to protect them from the multitudes of injuries and slights and, and that kind of thing that, you know, we all have to deal with in the course of, of daily life. I'm Nico Perino with the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and I'm here in New York today with Professor Laura Kipnis. She is a professor at Northwestern University in the Department of Radio, TV, and Film, and she is the author of an essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education called Sexual Paranoia Strikes Academe. Laura, thank you for joining us today. Hi. Uh, why Sexual Paranoia Strikes Academe? What on campus is happening that prompted you to write this essay? Well, the Chronicle had asked me to write an essay just generally about sexual politics on campus and taking up any aspect of it that I wanted to. And our university had passed this ban about a year prior to this um, on consensual relations between faculty and students or between undergrads and professors. So I started out talking about all of the uh, faculty members on, on campuses who are currently married to their former students. And you know, here you've got these people, deans, senior professors, well-known people married to former students who have now been turned into sexual outlaws, you know, after the fact, just by, you know, by this, these new regulations. There was some fallout from the essay, particularly a group of students protesting some of your opinions on these issues on campus. There was a protest march, if I understand correctly, on campus. There was a petition. Can you talk about some of those? And were you confused by the reaction that you received to this to this essay? Were you expecting it? Um, no, I wasn't expecting it at all. And I didn't know anything about it until a reporter said to me, they're marching against you on campus. And it turned out I looked at this student paper. There was an online uh, photograph of students carrying mattresses and pillows protesting my article, which they said was creating a chilling effect on campus. And I thought, well, this isn't really going to look good for the students because it just seems so absurd. You know, mm -hmm. as everybody knows, the marching with mattresses refers to the Columbia student marching about sexual assault. You know, I hadn't assaulted anyone. I'm a feminist. So I thought it was kind of an absurd overreaction. And they were carrying a petition to the president's office demanding that I be censured, I guess it was, for this article. And, you know, in a way I thought, well, this is going to not be entirely bad for me because it will mean that the article will be read a lot more, which is, mm -hmm. which is what happened. So you're thrown into this whole process, you write your essay, and a couple weeks later you get an email from the Title IX coordinator saying you're brought up on Title IX charges, uh, you know nothing about the Title IX system, they're not giving you much information, you find out that you can't record your, your sessions, you can't have a lawyer, you're allowed to have a support person, am I right. correct? Yes. And. Uh, you're not allowed to know the substance of the charges in courts until you meet with these lawyers. The letter said that I was being uh, brought up on charges because of the essay and also subsequent public statements, which turned out to be a tweet. Did the university tell you who the complainants were or what did they tell you about the complaint in general? Did you know anything? I knew very little. I got this letter. It said that I was being charged with retaliation and it didn't say who the complainants were and they were appointing two uh, outside lawyers not employed by the university from a firm in another city and that these lawyers would be in touch with me to set up a meeting where they would tell me about the charges. Mm -hmm. So one of the you know interesting things about this is you never get the charges in writing and I've heard that from other people since. So let's talk a little bit about what that investigation entailed. Yeah, it's because I we were not in the same city, and so I agreed to have a, a Skype meeting where they told me the charges, but they wouldn't write them down, and they wouldn't let me record the Skype session. So I was like typing, you know, as they were talking, you know, like a stenographer while they're telling me the charges. And at that point, they told me who the complainants were, and they were not. I didn't know these students; they were not my students; they were in another department. And the students were just offended. One of them filed the complaint on behalf of the university community, which thought yeah. that your article created an unsafe space for students to report Title IX violations or sexual harassment complaints. Well, that's, I mean, you can't exactly assess what the university thinks, you know, or what uh -huh. the community thinks, which became an interesting issue when there was this claim that I had created a chilling effect on people's ability to report, you know, sexual misconduct. And I said, how do they know that? Mm -hmm. The other person 
was somebody I had written seven or eight words about in connection with this mm -hmm. professor who'd been uh, brought up on charges, and that was all in the public record at that point because there had been various uh, lawsuits. So there were seven or eight words about that student, and on that basis she filed the Title IX charges. Were you aware of the whole Title IX bureaucracy or system that has uh, come into place now? And did the university provide you with any information about it? I didn't have a clue. I mean, I was stunned when I got this email because, and I was also stunned just at the term retaliation because I didn't even know who these students were to begin with. And I hadn't named anyone. Um, and uh, I wasn't the person who'd been charged in the first place. So I didn't see, I didn't see how I could have retaliated against someone. You know, I mean, there hadn't been an, a, original charges against me. So let's talk about the latter part of this process. You have this two and a half hour meeting, yeah. and then you say you're gonna get the results of the investigation 60 days later. 60 days goes by, yeah. you have no results of the investigation, and you write the, the article, My Title IX Inquisition in yeah. the Chronicle of Higher Education. What caused you, or what was the impetus to write it? Was it the fact that 60 days had gone by and you still hadn't heard, and you decided, I need to reveal this publicly? Or what was, the, what was your thinking there? You know, it seemed clear to me that my rights as a, you know, I mean, not just in terms of academic freedom, but I mean, constitutional rights as I understand them were being abridged, and they were being abridged by a federal process. So once I got over this, you know, initial uh, surprise, I knew right away that I was going to write about this because I didn't know whether this was some kind of test case. I didn't know if other people had been brought up on Title IX charges over an article. I was pretty sure that it was a vast overreach um, or overstepping of what the process was designed to address, which is gender discrimination and since 2011, sexual violence um, on campuses. And I knew that had nothing to do with you know, I had written an article. So I thought, well, as a writer, this is a very interesting subject to just find yourself in the middle of. Was there a gag order on you during the course of this investigation? I thought there was. I mean, they say to you, there's a lot of language about confidentiality. And um, I had some, via my faculty support person, uh, some contact with the provost officer, the associate provost, to ask, well, what does that mean, confidentiality, and what are the repercussions if I don't uh, keep it confidential? And they talk about retaliation. I mean, there's a lot of threats that even speaking about it can be construed as, re as retaliatory. And I've since heard uh, about other people uh, brought up on Title IX charges who are, I mean, they are terrified to talk about it publicly because the threats that come down from these Title IX officers, or sometimes it's like affirmative action equal opportunity offices, uh, saying that you can lose your job if you speak about the process. And you said you, in your article that you came of age in a different time and under a different version of feminism. You said that a lot of this is driven by the administration at the universities, but a lot of it's driven by the students as well. Correct? Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of collaboration going on between this generation of student activists and campus bureaucrats, campus administrators, you know, in concert with, I mean, as I learned later, the federal government in the form of Title IX and the, you know, Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights. So, you know, that right away is something to raise questions about. I mean, this, this, these affiliations. So, you know, raising questions was, was what I wanted to do and what I, what I did do. And you, you talk about this new culture of injury, culture of victimhood on campus that's driving a lot of this. And what do you mean by that? Are students these days, is it less a culture of empowerment, more a culture of victimhood, as you said? Yeah, a culture of vulnerability. And my sense was that all of these protections were not making people less vulnerable. It, they were making people more vulnerable, students more vulnerable. They were going to be impeded when they leave university and go out into the world. And nobody is you know, going to protect them from the multitudes of injuries and slights and, and that kind of thing that you know, we all have to deal with in the course of, of daily life. Mm -hmm. You wrote that unconstrained intellectual debate is now on life support on campus. So what do you see as the future for this sort of thing then uh, moving forward? Do you think there's any hope that um, we'll get unconstrained intellectual debate off life support? Or do you think it's only going to get worse in the near future? 
I, you know, to some degree, I think professors have to kind of step up and start protesting a lot of this. You know, like all of us, nobody wants to make students uncomfortable. I mean, if we're talking about controversial things or things that people might be uh, feel, you know, sens sensitive about, I mean, I don't see a problem with saying in advance to a class, oh, this is some tough material or I'll have strong reactions to this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you negotiate these situations in teaching situations, but I don't think you want to have policies restricting what people say, or even this idea of safe spaces. I mean, I just think it's a it's a useless sort of slogan and supported by administrations in ways that I find distressing and appalling. Well, Laura, I appreciate you joining us today. And uh, with the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, I'm Nico Perino. Thank you. Thank you.